The upcoming talk is um, done by Frank. He has delivered the first episode of that yesterday already. Um, yesterday he focused on the first part of the title, why we are addicted to lithium. Today he's going to focus on the second part and how we shake that habit. Um, Frank is actually working in the science department of the, news uh, the online news magazine Golem. Uh, in case you've missed it, go see part one as well. It's recorded. And now all the best and enjoy the talk. Frank, stage is yours. Thanks. Uh, and of course, there are lots of heralds that also uh, really help uh, <laughs> with the talks. And I thank Cutson Point for being my herald today. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, yesterday, I talked about lithium ion batteries and why we became addicted to lithium. Um, so, what can we do about it? And I already hinted that we are going to talk about sodium. And uh, last year, uh, one of the big announcements uh, was uh, that CATL, Cuttle, I used to call them Cuttle, um, which is the Chinese company uh, Contemporary Amprex Technologies, uh, announced that they will produce sodium ion batteries. Um, and they will produce them uh, starting in two years. They are starting to build up all the infrastructure, all the factories that they need to actually build these batteries. Um, uh, in terms of the cells uh, that has been developed, um, as uh, guys like Elon Musk like to say, uh, prototypes are easy, production is hard. Um, so production takes a little bit longer, but they will come. And uh, what they announced was a battery that has 160 watt hours per kilogram, um, was fast charging, uh, retained uh, a lot of uh, the capacity, even in cold temperatures, much more than most other batteries. Um, they're more heat resistant and they're also safer than lithium ion batteries. They use no lithium, no cobalt, nickel, graphite, no copper, and they're much cheaper. And a lot of people um, just uh, rubbed their eyes and thought, um, what is going on? Is that, can that be true? And the point is, yes, it is. Uh, it is true. And in fact, uh, it's not even possible to build such batteries, but it has been done uh, a long time ago. Um, our first examples of the same kind of construction of batteries, uh, even though they were worse, a little bit worse than, uh, was done in the United States, uh, funded by the ARPA-E project, uh, that's the Department of Energy, uh, that funded the development uh, for $2.9 million, uh, not much money, um, and uh, that was done in uh, 2012 to 2016, and they developed uh, the exact same kind of battery, uh, even though it only had 20% uh, less uh, capacity. It was quite stable, uh, could last over a thousand cycles, many more than 1,000 uh, charge cycles. So uh, very nice technology indeed. Um, it's just that, well, they they then went on and funded the company uh, called Novasis and tried to sell it and they didn't find any investors or buyers. Uh, and that was that. Uh, that uh, similar story happened with lithium iron phosphate um, that we talked about in the last uh, in the last talk that was also invented and uh, completely developed in the United States and nobody really cared. Um, there are also other companies and I listed them here on the slide uh, like Ferrarion, uh, which is certainly one of the biggest, uh, also Tiamat and Altras. Uh, Altras has the chance to become one of the biggest. Uh, they also develop similar uh, chemistry. And so the problem was never, uh, is the technology there? The problem was always, is there investment? Will there be enough money uh, to, to actually build those batteries? And uh, CATL is the biggest... Uh, producer of batteries worldwide and uh, when they sit, when they announce uh, they will uh, build these batteries uh, you can pretty much believe them they have the money they have the resources they know how to do that um, 
also uh, the technology is very similar to how lithium works. Uh, it's really uh, just the same. You have a cathode on uh, the left side and you have an anode on the right side. And when you charge battery, uh, the sodium ions uh, go from the cathode to the anode uh, are stored there in the hard carbon. Uh, it's hard carbon, it's not graphite. We will talk about that more. And uh, when you discharge it, uh, it goes in the other direction. Uh, and the ions uh, go back from the anode to the cathode, and the electrons also go back from the anode to the cathode. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just that you can use the electricity from the electrons that are flowing through the wires uh, for whatever you want to do. Um, so uh, sodium is worse than lithium. It's not the first choice for building a battery because it's slightly worse. It's three times heavier than lithium. And it's actually not that bad uh, when you look at the entire thing because a typical battery weighs about four kilograms per kilowatt hour. Um, that's uh, maybe not the best possible battery. Uh, it's slightly less than four kilogram for uh, the newest kinds of batteries. But uh, the lithium inside is about 130 grams. And when you, if you just replace that by sodium, it would be 300 grams heavier. It's not that much. And uh, also when you use sodium, you don't need copper. Um, as you have seen on the other slide, uh, both sides are aluminum. Normally on the right side with the hard carbon on the anode, you would need copper because lithium uh, just uh, combines with aluminum and uh, starts to destroy it. So you cannot use aluminum, so you use copper. And copper is much heavier, and so you're saving like one or two hundred grams of uh, of material by replacing it with aluminium. And uh, so the difference is just <laughs> negligible almost. Um, the big difference is really the voltage. Uh, you lose about 0 0.3 volts, and that's about 10% uh, of the voltage. And uh, voltage is, uh, well, it's... Uh, it's almost the same as energy. It's the energy per electron uh, that is flowing. And so you lose 10% of the energy. And that's a, that's a much bigger difference, actually. Um, so all in all, you can you really lose uh, from the physical properties about 20%, a bit more than 10%. Um, what has been developed uh, from, uh, uh, from Sharp Labs and also from CATL is a battery using Prussian blue as the cathode. And uh, this cathode has iron uh, as its main, uh, as as the atom that the sodium has to react with. And uh, the rest is carbon and nitrogen in a nice uh, crystalline uh, grid uh, that just takes up, the, takes up the sodium, allows it to react with the iron and uh, be extracted from it. And that works just fine. It's just that the structure is uh, fairly large, uh, has a large volume, and that's why it has a low density. Um, density is about two grams per cubic centimeter, and that's quite low for uh, a cathode material. But otherwise, it's quite okay. It's almost the same as lithium iron phosphate. It's just that it takes more space in the battery. Um, <laughs> okay, um, the other the other point uh, that that people looked at and were incredulous is, well, it, they, they must be promising too much. Um, battery is charging so fast, uh, it, it works better in the cold. How is that possible? And uh, the point is, uh, with sodium, because sodium doesn't react so easily with uh, all the stuff around it, um, uh, it, the sodium ions can flow easier through the through the electrolyte and you get higher ionic conductivity in the same kind of electrolyte and you use the same kind of kinds of electrolytes. Uh, and yeah, that's how you can charge them faster. Uh, also the electrolyte that you, you can use is propylene carbonate. And normally you cannot use a lot of that um, because it would destroy graphite and you'd use graphite in the lithium ion battery as the anode. With sodium, Graphite doesn't work. Um, you use graphite because uh, you can put the uh, you can put the lithium ion ions in the layers of the between the layers of the graphite. But uh, sodium is bigger and uh, it's too big for graphite, and so you cannot use it. And so you can use uh, 
you can use the uh, uh, propylene carbonate uh, and uh, just benefit from that because it has much lower melting point um, and you can use it at, at freezing temperatures. And uh, yeah, yeah, hard carbon is uh, not as regular um, and it has been used for the last 20 years, uh, actually in the year 2000, were, were the first reports of using hard carbon as sodium anodes. And uh, this material is now very reliable, has very long lifetime, very long cycle life. Uh, the performance has been improved over the last 20 years, uh, ever further. And uh, yeah, it's it's not experimental. It's absolutely sure that this is going to work. Uh, nobody really has any problems with carbon except for um, uh, some of the performance issues, like uh, lower density. It's not. It doesn't have the same density as graphite because, um, as you get, not very ordered. Uh, graphite is neatly stacked and very well ordered, so it has higher density. Uh, the hard carbon does not. And you also get higher first cycle losses. Um, this has been improved recently, <laughs> but um, it's it's not quite up to the standards of graphite. With graphite, you lose about four or five percent. With hard carbons, it's more like ten percent or so. It used to be twenty percent, uh, and that's a major reason why the current uh, why the current batteries by from Cuttle are uh, much better than the sharp lab batteries. On the other hand, uh, you don't. It's it's not graphite, so you don't need the high temperatures that you need to uh, make graphite as a synthesis. And you like to have synthesized artificial graphite, not natural graphite, because it has better properties. You can control the the properties. Um, lower temperatures means it's uh, not as energy intensive. It's more environmentally friendly to do this synthesis, and it's also cheaper. Um, <laughs> The uh, the other advantage is it's not neatly stacked. Uh, it's an irregular structure, and because it's an irregular structure, you don't have a hard limit uh, as to how many atoms you can store in the structure, and uh, you can actually get beyond uh, the amount of uh, atoms that you can that you could store in uh, in graphite. Um, it's just uh, fairly hard to reach that, and it hasn't quite been reached, uh, at least not not reliably. Um, CATL is claiming 350 milliamp hours per per gram, uh, and that is very similar to what graphite, what pure graphite would do. Another thing that uh, a lot of people uh, really get wrong, and I mean uh, people like scientists uh, working in battery um, in the industry as well, uh, they keep saying, well, sodium ion batteries are not good enough for cars. Um, I don't understand why. I, I really don't. Uh, a lot of people talk about that and they never argue with numbers. They just say, well, it's worse than lithium. And because it's worse than lithium, it's obviously not good enough for cars. Uh, and But when you look at the numbers, uh, you can say, uh, well, it's the same numbers as you would get in a Tesla Model 3, and that's a car that is sold for over $40,000. If it's good enough for a car that costs more than $40,000, um, you can assume that it's probably good enough for a car, um, and not just a short-range, uh, very cheap car, but uh, cars in general. Um, uh, the volumetric density that I've uh, that I have here is uh, an estimation because uh, CATL didn't publish that figure, but uh, you can make very plausible assumptions uh, how high you can get how high you can get the volumetric density. My estimate is about 180 watt hours per liter. Uh, if you want details, please ask me in the Q and A. Uh, time is unfortunately very short. Um, so yes, uh, sodium is good enough for cars. Uh, by the way, that good enough is not a mistake by me. Uh, John Goodenough had a hand in uh, developing uh, the Prussian blue. Uh, he he has still he's still working at university and has a research group there. And uh, in uh, I believe 2011, uh, when he was about 90 years old, <laughs> um, his group uh, published the research on Prussian blue and that it could be used for a sodium ion battery. Um, it's incredible. Um, John Goodenough is a really 
despite his uh, old age, uh, he's going to have his 100th birthday next year. Um, still very active in the community and in the uh, in development. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, sodium ion batteries uh, don't just need uh, anodes. They also need cathodes. Uh, the cathode is uh, the core of the battery, actually. That's where all the chemistry happens. And uh, Prussian blue, we talked about this. Uh, it has a, a very decent performance. Uh, the material itself, if you only have the cathode material, is 500 watt hours per kilogram in energy density, but it has a low density. It's only two grams per cubic centimeter, and that's quite low. The problem with that is uh, you need more volume, and all the gaps in the volume uh, need to be filled with electrolyte. And uh, so you need more electrolyte, and that means uh, it weighs more. And uh, so the the ultimate energy density will be worse than if you had a material that has a higher uh, higher energy density. Also, the cells take a little bit more volume. Um, there's a second uh, material that is very popular. Uh, it's vanadium phosphate. Uh, is great for very high power uh, applications. Uh, you can uh, charge and discharge at 10 C or 20 C uh, for thousands of times with that material, but it has a much lower energy density or a somewhat lower energy density, um, especially at high power. It's it's much lower. Um, uh, but it works. It has been developed by Tiamat in France, uh, and actually, it, it's originally from the uh, from lithium. It has been has been adapted to to sodium. Uh, and then there are layered oxides. Uh, layered oxides are the same kinds of materials that you would have in lithium ion batteries. Most lithium ion batteries. Um, what is usually used here is, man is manganese. It's not so much nickel based. Uh, you can use nickel, and sometimes nickel is used. Um, to improve the, the energy density, but um, there have been very good results uh, with almost pure manganese oxide with just some uh, stabilizing other materials. And you can get 600 watt hours per kilogram and some of the best uh, lithium materials uh, only reach about 750. So it's about 80% of what you would get with uh, lithium. But there are some other problems. Um, <laughs> Um, the problem with sodium is uh, because the sodium ions are bigger than lithium, uh, the structure is um, somewhat different uh, in the materials and you can choose. <laughs> you can choose between either having a material that is very stable and that can reach very high energy uh, densities, but uh, you have to synthesize it in a way uh, where you only have two thirds of the sodium. Uh, inside the material, and the rest of the sodium has to come from the outside. Uh, and usually, when you have a battery, uh, you have all the when you have a lithium ion battery, you have all the lithium inside the battery, inside the cathode of the battery. When you uh, when you build the battery, and then you just charge it and move the move the lithium over to the anode side. Uh, when you want to use these sodium poor and very stable materials, then you need to get uh, your sodium from elsewhere. Either you already have it in the anode side or you put it into some other material. And uh, research has been going on to put it into all sorts of things. Uh, the binder that keeps all the, all the powder together, uh, the separator that separates the anode and the cathode, um, even the, the conductive carbon. Uh, people try to put some sulfur in the conductive carbon and uh, combine it with sodium so the sodium could be released uh, and so on so there's uh, um there's a lot of development going on there to to use that the other way is um you have a sodium rich structure that is somewhat more unstable only lasts for a few hundred cycles but what you can do is you can get a structure that is kind of in between and uh where you get at least a bit more than 500 watt hours per kilogram and uh that is um, that has been demonstrated already. Um, and Faradion, uh, which is in Great Britain, uh, they have uh, demonstrated a material like that for, with about 500 watt hours per kilogram. <laughs> um, their batteries are also uh, uh, very safe. Um, the safety of sodium ion batteries is in general much better um, than lithium ion batteries, um, because the sodium salts um, disintegrate at higher temperatures. Um, the sodium salts are like the first um, 
the first thing that's starting to disintegrate when you heat up a battery. And uh, the problem with that is there's fluorine in these uh, in these salts, and the fluorine starts to react with the electrolyte around it, and it starts to get it starts to um, increase the temperature of the battery even a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And at some point you reach the point where the cathode material itself starts to disintegrate and release oxygen or uh, some other volatile uh, components. And uh, the entire thing starts to heat up and uh, essentially combust. Um, That's a big problem with the NMC materials, nickel, manganese, carbonate for uh, uh, nickel manganese cobalt for lithium ion batteries, uh, which can be uh, very flammable. Um, It's much less a problem with other materials. Um, One of the other advantages is that you can use propylene carbonate, which is liquid at low temperatures. Um, In uh, lithium ion batteries, you have to use ethylene carbonate, which has a much higher melting point, only gets liquid at around 30 degrees. Uh, so in a very warm summer day, it would be liquid, otherwise it's solid. And you need to mix it with other components that are very volatile, that have, uh, and uh, um, yeah, turn into gas very easily and are very flammable. And uh, so that's one of the main reasons why lithium ion batteries uh, can turn into fireballs very quickly. Uh, and you don't need those ad- those additives here to reduce the the melting point because the melting point's already very low. Um, yeah, so that's why the flammability is not quite so bad. Um, the other point uh, in safety is you can discharge a battery, uh, a sodium ion battery, to zero volts because there's no copper in the current collector. Um, the copper would normally dissolve into the electrolyte and then. Uh, next time you start charging it, uh, after you fully discharged it, um, you would get copper somewhere in the battery, and that somewhere could be absolutely anywhere, and you can get shortcuts, and you can absolutely destroy the battery like that. That's why uh, lithium-ion batteries um, must never be completely discharged. Uh, It's very dangerous, actually. Uh, There's no problem with that in sodium-ion batteries, and that means you can work on it, you can completely uh, discharge a battery and work on it without having it at 400 or 500 volts or something like that and get shocked by that. Um, so everybody can can work on a fully discharged battery, no problem. Um, a very big benefit in terms of safety. Um, of course, uh, energy density is very important, and uh, a lot of people think that sodium ion batteries, because they're not the highest energy density, um, will not quite be enough, and they would like to have higher energy density. So there's a there's a possibility, and CATL in their presentation already uh, used this and showed that they are going to develop this, is to simply use both kinds of batteries in one car, in one battery pack. Um, so you use both sodium and lithium ion ion battery cells. Uh, So you can use some cheaper cells, the cheaper sodium ion cells, along with the lithium ion battery cells. And uh, you can get the best of both worlds, especially when it comes to the cold temperature performance. Uh, The sodium ion batteries can, uh, you can start driving your car with the sodium ion battery cars, uh, batteries while you heat up the lithium ion batteries, especially with lithium ion phosphate which is a technology that is uh, very sensitive to cold temperatures. And when you use both of them together, uh, you have a much better battery pack overall. And uh, in terms of energy density, uh, you can uh, really choose what you want, um, depending on, and I've done it here with uh, watt hours per kilogram, but it works the same with watt hours per liter, depending on whether you your problem is uh, depending on getting uh, uh, small volume or small mass, uh, whatever you want. And uh, so if you if you choose uh, 75% sodium, uh, you can get a slight, a slight increase in energy density. Um, if you just want to, uh, if you just give up on, on 10 uh, watt hours per kilogram, so you go from 170 watt hours per kilogram to 160, uh, you can save 25% of the lithium in the battery pack. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, absolutely possible to save a lot of lithium that way, and uh, especially when, you're, when the lithium supply is tight, uh, this can be very important. 
Um, the materials used, uh, especially uh, this is again for the uh, CATL battery, um, is aluminum, iron, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, hydrocarbon, uh, and some phosphorus and fluorine. Um, and that's it. Um, those are very common elements. And this is uh, from the Wikipedia article of the uh, crustal abundance of uh, elements. And you can find them all here at the top of the list. Uh, um, lithium would be at uh, place 33, I think, uh, along with nickel, um, something like that. Um, as you can see, uh, a lot of these elements are very high up. Uh, also look at place 12, that is manganese, and manganese is a very popular choice for the layered oxides in uh, sodium ion batteries in the cathodes here. Uh, cost can be much cheaper, uh, especially because the raw materials are so cheap. Uh, but it's not just the raw materials. Uh, the synthesis uh, is also much cheaper because um, uh, the layered oxides are ceramics. Um, and if you know how to make ceramics, um, you know that you have to fire it at very high temperatures. And uh, if you have a cup like this, the ceramic would have to be heated up at uh, almost a thousand uh, degrees Celsius um, to make this into a ceramic. Um, but for the Prussian blue, uh, the temperatures you need is no more than the hot tea that I have here in the cup. And that I really need now. Um, the, the cost is very low. Um, uh, the material cost is like a dollar or something like that. It's very, very low. And uh, for the completed material, it's just a few dollars per kilowatt hour. In most batteries, the cathode is the most expensive part of the battery. Uh, in sodium ion batteries, uh, it's uh, well, it's not the cheapest part, but it's among the cheap parts. Um, so uh, the the manufacturing is much more important. So if you can scale up your your manufacturing plants to be very big and very cheap, uh, then the batteries themselves can be very cheap. And that's how CATL uh, wants to achieve like 30 or $45 per kilowatt hour. And that's quite possible, especially because the salts that you need and the electrolyte is much cheaper and you don't need copper for the foils. And because the electrolyte is much more resistant to high temperatures, you can use higher temperatures for the drying process after you have coated the, uh, after you have coated the, uh, foils with uh, with your cathode and your anode material and then it's wet and you have to dry it out and you do that in long ovens and the higher the temperature you can use uh, the shorter time is required and the shorter and smaller your ovens can be. <laughs> An important thing that uh, strangely enough was brought up time and again by uh, a lot of people who doubted uh, this development is that yeah we have seen so many startups uh, promising new technology. Well, CATL is not a startup. Uh, it's it's the largest battery manufacturer in the world. I, I don't I don't know how these these arguments uh, uh, even started. Uh, it's very strange. They have years of experience. Uh, they have support by the Chinese government officially, and uh, they will not suddenly start lying about what they can do with their technology, especially because we know this technology. It has been developed years ago. Uh, we all know it's possible, at least if you if you read uh, in the in the literature and if you followed uh, the old developments, um, you will have to get used to the idea that this is actually going to happen. It's not going to happen on a small scale. It's going to happen on a big scale because it's the biggest uh, battery manufacturer in the world. Um, so sodium ion batteries will come, and they will come in two years, and you better be prepared. Um, not like the people who are surprised by uh, lithium ion phosphate these days. Okay, two slides. Um, what's next? Uh, next is the second generation that was announced. Uh, will be about 200 watt hours per kilogram, uh, similar to LFP. Um, this is a similar performance to what Faradion is already demonstrating. Uh, using layered oxides, but uh, if you just uh, exchange the uh, the Faradion's uh, own anode materials with what, what CATL has announced, you already get to 200 watt hours per kilogram. So this is kind of quite realistic. 
Um, the big question is uh, what kind of layered uh, oxide will uh, CATL use? And they have said absolutely nothing on that. Uh, if there's nickel inside or not, uh, nickel would be a bit more expensive. Uh, most materials are dominated by manganese, though, so they should be quite cheap. But they are ceramics, so they need higher temperatures and uh, uh, processing costs uh, quite a bit more. Um, okay, and after that, um, because uh, I think the uh, the rumors are that CATL will announce the second generation this uh, this coming year in 2022. Um, we will see. Uh, it's certainly quite realistic. The the uh, technology is not that far away um, because layered oxides have been demonstrated to be uh, possible and uh, CATL has all the rest of it. Um, so after that, uh, what we will probably see is anode materials using pre um that can achieve uh, higher capacity and also fewer losses in the first cycle. Uh, first cycle loss are ty typically about 10%, and if you can uh, just uh, reduce these losses by just putting more, more sodium in in the first place, uh, that would be great. Uh, and... And then you could also use these layered material, these layered oxide materials uh, that don't have enough sodium in the layered oxides uh, at the beginning in doing construction of the battery, and, and then you could reach uh, energy densities between 200 and 250 watt hours per kilogram, and uh, that would be uh, very similar to what uh, lithium-ion batteries have now. And of course, you can do solid-state batteries with lithium uh, with uh, a lithium um, anode. Uh, just pure uh, pure lithium anodes, but you need different separators. Uh, you can do the same with sodium and pure sodium anodes, pure sodium metal, and would be much better. You would get much higher uh, energy density. But um, uh, with sodium, it should be actually easier to achieve that. Uh, the problem is it's harder to achieve that if you don't get money to do it. And right now, all the money goes into lithium-ion batteries. Um, so it's from from practical point of view, it's uh, much harder, even though from a physical point of view, it may even be uh, easier. Um, and in, in the future, we might see Prussian flu batteries with 250 watt hours per kilogram which is, granted, not that great. Uh, it's as good as uh, some average uh, lithium-ion batteries these days. Um, but it could be extremely cheap. Um, yeah. Maybe uh, that's a bit... These two slides were a bit of speculation. Okay, thank you, and I hand over to the Q&A. Hello? Okay, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk, Frank. Uh, Thanks. There are a couple of yeah, questions. Yeah, time was very actually. short again. Yeah, I realize that. Um, someone is wondering, is the biggest problem with our sodium battery, uh, batteries um, their weight? And if so, isn't that irrelevant for um, uh, stationary batteries such as used in uh, grid scales? Yes, exactly. Um, and that is, in fact, one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people said uh, sodium-ion batteries will only be used for um, for stationary storage. Uh, and that has become a bit of a meme, actually, And uh, because people kept saying, okay, it's just for stationary storage and maybe some light-duty vehicles, slow vehicles. Um, people just kept repeating on, kept repeating that and saying that. And nobody ever looked at the numbers. And at some point, uh, you ended up with a situation where, um, yeah, the numbers are in fact just as good as the Tesla Model 3, and people still didn't realize it, but kept uh, repeating the meme that uh, that sodium is not good enough for cars. <laughs> and yeah, um, yes, of course, uh, stationary storage, uh, absolutely, um, and. Uh, in a few years, uh, people will look at lithium-ion batteries used for stationary storage as a bit of a waste. All right, thank you. Um, are you aware of batteries with a lower density than water? Um, lower densities than water, I wouldn't know because that's kind of hard to do. Um, because you always need... Um, 
I mean, lithium has half the density of water, okay, uh, but you need to react it with something. And that that something you want to react it with, um, that is kind of hard. Um, uh, you can, of course, always build a battery that's much lighter than water by putting a few battery cells into a container and make it airtight, and it's uh, it has an average density that is lower than that of water. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, there are cathode materials that uh, are made up of polymers, uh, but you cannot, uh, you don't have uh, any sodium in those material. Uh, you can put sodium in and have the reaction and so on, but um, uh, yeah, uh, those are polymer, re polymer materials uh, that are in research, uh, might be quite cheap, uh, but they have other challenges in using them. Thanks. Uh, someone is wondering where to start when planning to recycle electronic stuff and trying to bring the materials back to whoever needs it, or is there some kind of a bay for materials? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that. Um, what was the, the last bit? Uh, is there some kind of bay for materials? So some place where you could bring these? Uh, okay. Um, right now... Right now, it's not. Um, uh, the problem with recycling of batteries right now, especially lithium-ion batteries in electric cars, uh, is simply that they are too good. Um, they they just, <laughs> um, unless you crash the car, the battery will usually last until, uh, well, <laughs> as long as the car is running. And most of the uh, lithium-ion batteries in cars are just uh, working there in the cars. Uh, some have been recycled, uh, but the, it's a minority of the entire of the entire thing. So um, uh, there are a lot of recycling uh, companies that have been, uh, that, that didn't quite get into business because um, their business model said that there would be a lot more uh, defective lithium ion batteries than there actually are these days. And uh, they, they, they want to recycle them, that, but they just can't find enough. And uh, it will take a bit more time uh, to get recycling and uh, will be similar with sodium ion batteries. Um, as soon as those batteries are actually available, as soon as the waste batteries are actually available, uh, you will get to see uh, some recycling going on, of course. Thank you. And uh, one galactic life form um, is wondering, um, and it, it, this is a bit far-fetched, but if that life form is remembering correctly, there was research on liquid batteries. Um, Yes. And probably that is a better term for that. Um, did anything happen in that department? Um, I, I did read about this about 10 years ago. So uh, I'm sure that something must have happened in that department, but uh, nothing that was, uh, nothing that ended up being um, commercially relevant uh, or Oh, I'm uh, I'm just thinking about which what kind of what kind of battery they meant. Um, there there are two kinds of liquid batteries. Uh, one where you had just two liquids on top of each other, and then just that just formed a battery, and they, you had to separate in between in between the two liquids more or less. Um, that's what I meant. Uh, the other is of course redox flow batteries, uh, like uh, most popular is vanadium uh, redox flow, and the problem with vanadium redox flow is that it has a uh, low voltage and that means you need a lot of vanadium to store uh, a given amount of energy and uh, it, it's just uh, not very competitive in terms of uh, in terms of the price per kilowatt hour um, but there are some other developments uh, also using sodium uh, also using other compounds uh, in that direction um, whether or not they will be competitive uh, we have to see um, I don't think that vanadium uh, redox flow is competitive, uh, even though some some demonstration units have been built, but they're usually very small, and uh, it's it's really just um, because they can get subsidies from it. All right, thank you. And last question for this talk: uh, Which batteries are better suited for bidirectional flows? Um, well, these are actually quite. Uh, they work in both directions uh, quite well, um, also at high power. Um, usually this charge is a bit better than charging a battery, um, because when you charge a battery, 
uh, you have to take care that you don't form uh, form pure metal and get metal dendrites uh, that might penetrate your your uh, separator, especially if you don't have a separate a separator material that is resistant to these dendrites, which uh, normally it's just like a piece of plastic, a porous plastic, uh, um, like a poly polyethylene, like you know, like your shopping bag or something just much much thinner and uh, porous. Um, and that can easily be penetrated and you don't want that. So you have to be, uh, you have to limit your, your charging speed, uh, especially at low temperatures where this can happen quite easily. Um, but other, other than that, it's, uh, it's, pretty much uh yeah it's just fine you can you can use them in both direction at uh, very similar uh, powers thank you